Uh, the universe has, of course, so far been observed to respect the principles of quantum mechanics. And we've in fact heard excellent evidence for that summarized at the conference uh, in a series of very beautiful experiments. And what I'm going to go after is the question of uh, what that might tell us about the ultimate quantum theory. Uh, if we assume that quantum mechanics is underlying the ultimate theory, uh, what implications does that have for what exists, observation and observers, the structure of quantum gravity, uh, cosmology and black holes, and so on. So first, sort of a roadmap of uh, the current state of uh, physics and, and hierarchies of how we discuss things. Uh, there's actually a hierarchy of approximations. Uh, we start with, say, the ultimate quantum theory, which we're trying to figure out, uh, and then through successive approximations reach the level of, say, non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And a lot of the conference so far has been kind of bouncing back and forth in this regime, it seems like. Uh, a lot of it kind of on the non-relativistic end, some dealing with uh, quantum field theory issues. Uh, I'm going to try to drive uh, towards the ultimate theory, although you know, obviously I don't have it in my back pocket at the moment, but I'd like to try to understand some of its properties. Uh, again, taking the viewpoint that we really are talking about a quantum theory. Okay, so uh, let's start with what exists in quantum mechanics. Uh, and here I've learned that in some respects, uh, well, there are differences on this. But what are the basic ingredients of the structure of quantum mechanics? Uh, well, uh, certainly a space of states, something like a Hilbert space. And so here I'm taking the viewpoint uh, that we've heard bandied about uh, that, you know, really the wave function is what exists. That's the sort of supreme thing. Uh, and of course, you know, if we think about the familiar concepts from the classical world, classical variables, for example, don't they exist? Well, no, not really. They only exist as labels on states, in a sense. Uh, and in fact, you know, if you think about the uh, say classical metric, does that exist? Or classical space-time? Well, in a quantum theory, that's uh, far from clear because we could certainly think about a superposition of metrics. And in such a state, there's no definite space-time that exists. So, you know, that's really one of the kinds of lessons we need to take seriously in a quantum theory. Now, of course, we need structure beyond just a space of states, a Hilbert space, in order to describe physics and what we observe. And so we need to figure out what that structure is, and quantizing a classical system has been one way of getting at that kind of structure. Uh, but that's not the only way of uh, trying to get at it. And I think we should consider what else we can say about such structure uh, without such a procedure, particularly because we've had such difficulties with applying this procedure to general relativity, ultimately that may be telling us that geometry is not the right starting point for gravity. Uh, perhaps it emerges in some sense from some more basic uh, quantum description. So we're after the structure beyond Hilbert space that we need to do physics. Uh, what are examples of the kind of structure we need. Well, there are various things uh, that you need in physics, uh, in quantum physics. Uh, here's a partial list. Uh, we would like to have a notion of subsystems, typically. Uh, we often need a notion of preferred observables, uh, preferred states, and a notion of evolution, either through a unitary operator, the evolution operator, or it's an infinitesimal version that generates it, uh, colloquially the Hamiltonian. And certainly we've seen a role for all of these ingredients in a lot of the previous talks in this conference. So in particular, uh, let's think about the subject of observation and observables in quantum mechanical systems. And of course, uh, one of the essential starting points, or an essential starting point for that, 
is to take a quantum system and say, the, let's call it the universe or, or whatever quantum system you're considering, and divide it into subsystems. And that's, that kind of division is important for describing observation, uh, as is illustrated by this picture. This is a good observing situation where we maintain a nice, healthy division between the lion and these guys. Uh, and we know that if we don't maintain that healthy division, uh, we don't have a good observing situation. We have a bloody mess. Okay, so <laughs> healthy for the lion, not for everyone, however. Not for the observees, okay, only for the observer. <clears throat> okay, so how do we uh, describe such a division in the context of quantum theory? And how, how do we describe observation? Well, the way it's been done so far in a lot of the talks here uh, is along these lines. So we have our big system and we divide it into subsystems. We describe the division in terms of a uh, product of Hilbert spaces. So we have, say, an observee subsystem and an observer subsystem. And then, of course, we want to describe uh, the evolution of the combined systems. We imagine that the Hamiltonian has a piece which acts on the observee subsystem, a piece that acts on the observer subsystem, and then a piece that uh, contains interactions between the two. And then, through evolution by that Hamiltonian, uh, we can start with, say, a state that's a superposition of, uh, say, states of the observee subsystem and some fiducial state of the ob observer subsystem. Uh, and we evolve and we basically correlate the state of the observer with that of the observee in a fashion like this. <coughs> and that's the essential way of describing, you know, it, it's the basic notion of an observation. There are some additional conditions and bells and whistles we need to add if we want it to be a, a good observation for various purposes. Uh, so I won't go into the details. We've heard various discussion of that here. Uh, we'd like, for example, to have decoherence, stability of records, and so on. So we have conditions like the statement that <coughs> uh, we lose interference between these two branches. Uh, so for at least reasonable operators, these off-diagonal matrix elements vanish, <coughs> and, and so on. But, you know, this is the sort of the essence of observation. Uh, so, it, and in fact, this... Uh, leads to a description of observation that matches on to you know, our classical notions of observation. There uh, might be an operator there that uh, in one state gives you an eigenvalue that corresponds to Clinton winning the election, and in another state to uh, Trump winning the election. And so we have this evolution which uh, predicts what we would in the classical world describe as probabilities for uh, these various outcomes. There are very explicit toy models for this, uh, going back quite some time. Uh, the Coleman-Hepp model, for example, also, you know, Jim has a, a nice model with similar features uh, involving decoherence in uh, a two-slit experiment. Uh, so you can write down explicitly a Hamiltonian, for example, that correlates uh, the state of a single spinning particle with a collection of spins and exhibits a number of these features. Uh, Sidney uh, explained this nicely in a single phrase, as he often could, uh, you know, the past is present memory in this kind of description. So just to emphasize, uh, first I've used the basic ingredients that I listed on my slide a few slides ago. And uh, secondly, of course, I'm considering purely unitary evolution, nothing more. And out of that comes, you know, an effective uh, you know, sort of, well, Copenhagen description of observation, but that's not fundamentally what's going on. It's just unitary evolution. Two other parenthetical comments. Uh, so first, paradoxically, and I put that in quotes because it's not really a paradox, what is observed to exist in quantum mechanics isn't what exists in quantum mechanics. You know, what we see is not necessarily what exists. Your counterparts in other parts of the wave function can observe something else, and that's just the way it seems to be. Uh, 
also, there doesn't seem to be a primary role for events in this story. Uh, you know, that's not something you start with. Uh, it may come out in some effective sense. And this is just part of the irreducible weirdness of quantum mechanics. And, you know, maybe we just have to get used to that. Okay, so moving on, you know, down my diagram, uh, you know, going backwards against the successive approximations, let's think a little bit about quantum field theory. And quantum field theory, of course, describes all known physics, with the exception of gravity, which we're still struggling with. But it does respect the principles of quantum mechanics. And so you might think we could run all of this uh, perfectly well for quantum field theory. Oops. <coughs> there is, however, one subtlety for quantum field theory, uh, which is due to the structure of its Hilbert space. Uh, you don't, uh, well, you can't write uh, the Hilbert space of quantum field theory, say, if you take two adjacent regions in terms of a product of uh, Hilbert spaces. That's due to the type 3 von Neumann structure, or type 3 structure of the von Neumann algebras associated with quantum field theory. Colloquially, we could say it's due to infinite entanglement. And so you might be a little worried about that, but really I don't think you should be so worried. There's an alternative uh, which you can use in defining subsystems. Instead of focusing on products of Hilbert spaces, you should focus on the commuting subalgebras, say the algebras of observables supported here or here in different regions. And that's a nice way of defining subsystems that gives you most or probably all of the structure that you need to run the previous arguments. As you can, you can go back and see, basically you're using the structure of this algebra of observables, or at least you can use that. Uh, and, and that's all you really need uh, for the essential aspects of the story I just told. So let's <coughs> move on to the question of quantum gravitational systems. And if quantum mechanics is weird, it's you know, become increasingly clear quantum gravity is weirder still. And it, really what I'm going to do is share a set of puzzles uh, that I think we face now. Uh, I won't yet share a resolution. So, of course, we don't know the complete theory of quantum gravity, but let's assume that it reduces to weak field uh, general relativity when we're thinking about weak fields. And here, actually, we don't even have this structure of commuting subalgebras, it appears. So there's an issue in defining subsystems. How to explain this? Well, let's think a little bit more about the story of just quantum field theory. The basic operator in quantum field theory that you think about is, say, an operator that creates or annihilates particles, a, a point, say an electron. Forget about the electric field, by the way. Uh, so let's just think about a particle like the electron. Uh, <coughs> if we want to consider an operator that creates an electron in the context of a theory of gravity, well, the electron is inseparable from its gravitational field. Put differently, you need to consider, uh, well, the operator phi of x alone is not gauge invariant. To write down a gauge invariant operator, you have to dress the electron with its gravitational field. You have to consider an operator that creates both the particle and its gravitational field. And this actually provides an obstruction to having this notion of commuting subalgebras basically because the gravitational dressings uh, meet, and so these two operators uh, don't uh, commute. And you can actually work this out in a fair amount of detail, as has been done in these papers, uh, with Will Donnelly, who is a postdoc at Santa Barbara, who, is, by the way, will be on the market this fall. So take a close look at him. Uh, so this is kind of a nasty surprise. It's a failure of the standard notion of locality of local quantum field theory. Uh, you can try to quantify when it becomes important uh, through estimates of the uh, obstruction to commutativity, the relative size of that. Uh, here's just one, uh, well, this in fact comes out of calculations, but uh, you can estimate uh, when it becomes important. It's roughly speaking when gravitational fields become strong. And in fact, uh, this basic formula was previously given quite some time ago. Uh, in called a gravitational locality bound. It's telling you when this notion of locality is breaking down. Uh, and it's, I think, a little bit like an uncertainty principle. It's analogous to the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics, but now for quantum gravity. 
So we seem to have a question here. How do we even fundamentally define subsystems uh, in quantum gravity? And you know, everyone's been using a description of subsystems in what they've been saying, uh, both for observation in the context of this conference, but you know, more broadly, the community has been talking about entanglement questions, information transfer, and so on. All of that starts with the notion of subsystems. Uh, more generally, you know, there's an issue of separability, uh, which plays a key role in physics. You know, concerns about this <coughs> and the essential nature of this go back to Einstein, as George nicely explained, for example, or reviewed in his book. Uh, and you know, interestingly, Einstein's theory, quantized, is giving us a real challenge to this notion. What are the alternatives? Well, one possibility is <coughs> even if we can't precisely define subsystems in a fashion analogous to in quantum mechanics or in quantum field theory, maybe there's some weaker division of the uh, states of a Hilbert space that can be used. Uh, and then the natural question is, well, what precise mathematical structure gives you that division, say if it's not commuting subalgebras of the algebra of observables? Uh, and with such structure, can we rerun the previous discussion of how we describe observation that I briefly reviewed? Uh, another alternative is that perhaps a different framework is needed uh, for doing gravity than quantum mechanics. But what could that possibly be? That's a very good question. So I think these are, well, getting at some key questions for foundational progress. And these are certainly pertinent, this issue, to cosmology. Of course, in cosmology, the observer needs to be in the system, and so you need to have a way of dividing you know, the system into the subsystem of the observer and the, the rest. That's a challenge at the fundamental level. Uh, of course, in cosmology, there's an additional subtlety in evolution, uh, which must uh, be relational in the sense that we talk about things like the spectrum of density fluctuations uh, at, say, a given value of the influenton field. Uh, and for further discussion of that, I'll refer you to this paper, and also uh, Carlo has said a lot of nice things about that, and so on, and many other people. Uh, <coughs> so here we confront that basic question. Also in black holes, what we've learned is that locality is not rigorously defined in quantum gravity the same way it is in quantum field theory, although it is assumed to be in our familiar description of black holes. And so this raises two possibilities. One is that <coughs> we really need to modify our view of how information is localized in quantum field theory as compared to local quantum field theory. Another possibility is that this leads to an effective non-locality of interaction uh, in the context of quantum gravity. And uh, this is just really, uh, like Raphael, a, a slight plug for another talk or another, well, for a paper and another talk. This possibly could be connected to observational effects when you try to parameterize uh, effectively non-local interactions. You can get a picture like this for evolution of the shadow of a uh, black hole as seen by the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, and we've you know, looked at that closely in terms of numerical simulation uh, with Demetrius Saltus. Uh, in this view of quantum mechanics, the wave function or state is what exists. Additional structure is needed to make contact with prediction. We've talked about some of the basic elements of that. And with such structure, observation can be described in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Also apparently works more or less fine for quantum field theory. But in gravity, there's an issue with sharply defining subsystems and the basic notion of locality. And that seems to me likely connected with the fundamental quantum structure of space-time, whatever that is, uh, and is important for how we approach inflationary cosmology in the conundrums of black holes. That's it. <laughs>